consistent with semi-conservative replication. And a few more papers after that by Deb and others confirm the finding that replication is semi-conservative. That was done in bacteria in the coli. And again, within a year or two of that, those findings were replicated in eukaryotic cells so that we could say, in general, that replication is semi-conservative. So remember where semi-conservative came from. The same year that Watson and Crick published the double helix, a few months after the structural paper, the double helix, they published a second paper that says, well, the structure of the double helix suggests a mechanism for replication, and they published then the structure and said that every place that there is an A in the template, we find a T in the new screen. So we have new and old template. So this was the structure that has become known then as semi-conservative structure for replication. So this structure makes a prediction. If you look at this structure, you can see that the structure looks like a Y fork as the double helix opens up to provide the two template strands for the synthesis of the two new strands. So the Y fork then becomes a prediction of semi-conservative <coughs> semi replication. So a few years after the Messelson Stahl experiment, a fellow named John Cairns wanted to check the prediction that semi-conservative replication goes through this Y fork structure. But there was a slight problem in that in the 1960s, in the early 1960s, nobody had ever seen a bacterial chromosome. There were tons of pictures of eukaryote chromosomes going back to the 1800s, remember. But our chromosomes are really different. They're way bigger than bacteria, but they're chromatin. They have the nucleosome. Nobody had ever seen a bacterial chromosome. Whenever anybody opened up a bacterial cell to look at the DNA, all they saw were little bits and pieces of DNA. And so eukaryotes have multiple chromosomes. People thought, well, maybe bacteria have lots of little chromosomes. But data was beginning to accumulate. We talked about transduction, conjugation, transformation. And so from those experiments, people began to make genetic maps. And the genetic maps were showing very large chromosomes. In fact, some of the most complete genetic maps were showing a circular genetic map. <coughs> so a circular genetic map, one, two, three, four, five, six. So one is next to two, two is next to three, three is next to four, four is next to five, five is next to six. A circular map then has six next to seven. There is no end to a circular map. And so this was beginning to come out. And so people began doubting what they saw represented real bacterial chromosomes. And so John Cairns wanted to do two things. He wanted to see an intact bacterial chromosome that wasn't broken 
with the process of isolating it, and he wanted to verify the prediction of Watson Crick of the Y4. He knew, Cairns knew the Riddick cycle. He's already been through that. Remember in the Riddick cycle, the phage enters the bacteria, makes its own chromosomes and proteins, and then ruptures the cell with a lysozyme enzyme. So the enzyme that they use is called lysozyme. It lyses the cell from the inside out, freeing all the progeny, the virus progeny. Cairns grew up bacteria in a 55-gallon drum and then infected it with phage. And from 55 gallons of broken bacteria, isolated the enzyme lysozyme. Because he didn't want to isolate bacterial chromosomes the old-fashioned way, he took a drop of growing bacteria, put that drop on a microscope slide, and then added a drop of his lysozyme, and the bacteria just melted away and intact chromosomes flooded the microscope slide. I'm just going to draw one figure, give you an idea of what this looks like. So, first of all, we confirm the genetic data of a circular genetic map. He saw that virtually all the chromosomes were circular. And the second thing that jumps out is that he saw these bubbles in the chromosomes. He did this with bacteria in log phase that is growing rapidly. So I'm just drawing one figure. He saw all these bubbles from little tiny bubbles to bubbles that went almost all the way around the chromosome. And we're just going to look at one. And what you see here is exactly what the prediction of Watson and Crick was. Two Y forks. And so in 1963, Cairns' experiment confirmed the prediction of Watson and Crick that replication is proceeding via a Y fork, in fact, two in the circular chromosome. And secondly, he confirmed the prediction from the genetic mapping data that bacterial chromosomes are circular. Now, we now know that it's almost all there are a few bacteria that have linear chromosomes. Any questions on that, on this experiment? Okay, so as good science, this experiment by Cairns opened up a new question. And so the question is, let me redo this without the boxes. And Cairns could not distinguish between them. So one possibility is that the chromosome is open in the middle of the bubble. We now call the site that starts replication that opens the chromosome as ORI, O-R-I, which is short for origin. This is the origin of replication. And so one model is that the origin of replication is in the middle of the bubble, and the two Y forks are 
proceeding around. The second model has the origin there and replication proceeds around that way. This is called a bidirectional model because we have two Y ports going in two different directions and they would meet at 180 degrees. The second model, and this is one, the second model is a unidirectional with one Y fork and then the second one Y fork moving all the way around, 360 degrees around, meeting, coming back to the beginning. So Karen's pictures could not distinguish between a bidirectional model and a unidirectional model. If you take the labels off, can you see any difference in those pictures? Not really. They look exactly the same. And so this was 1963. From 1963, there was about 10 years of the ugliest science that you can imagine. The very, very difficult question to answer. And so somebody would publish a paper saying, I've got some kind of weak data that suggests it's bidirectional. And the next year, somebody would do it a little bit differently. You say, no, I have, I have other data that suggests it's unidirectional. And back and forth and back and forth until the early 1970s, at about the same time, two different papers were published. I'm not going to do either one of them. Uh, one of them is extremely complicated. Two papers were published very convincingly convinced everybody that bidirectional was the model. And so very quickly, so bidirectional became the model for bacteria and then became the model for eukaryotes. So the bacterial chromosome very definitely replicates in a bidirectional fashion. What I'm going to show you in a few minutes, so do the carrier chromosomes, but we don't get to throw out the unidirectional model. You know that in your cells you have mitochondria. Mitochondria are the energy supply source, maybe ATP for energy. Mitochondria have a chromosome. And the mitochondrial chromosome replicates unidirectional. And plants, the chloroplast chromosome replicates unidirectional. And so different chromosomes use both of those models. We're not going to do very much at all, if anything, with mitochondria and chloroplast. We are going to stick with bacteria and eukaryotes. So replication is bidirectional and semi-conservative. Phase 
and replicate its chromosomes, its whole genome, in two minutes. So let's look and see what a typical replicating eukaryotic chromosome looks like. First of all, in order to replicate the Drosophila genome in two minutes, you can't have a single origin per chromosome. Bacteria, and I don't know of an exception, bacteria have one single origin that works the whole chromosome. As this picture implies, and it's just a tiny part of a chromosome, that there are multiple origins of replication. But they work exactly <coughs> the way bacteria origins work. So replication is semi-conservative. Your replication is semi-conservative and bidirectional. Basic elements of replication are virtually identical in bacteria and in eukaryotes. But there are some really important differences. Bacteria have one origin per chromosome. You have hundreds, if not thousands, of origins per chromosome. And what you see here have a difference in size between origins. <coughs> what that means is that some origins fire, and that's, that's the terminology, the, the term for starting replication and opening an origin is called fire in the origin. So some origins replicate early. Those are the big origins. They, they have a head start. They started before the others. Other origins fire late. Remember the cell cycle. We're in S phase now. S phase is the unique part of interphase where DNA is replicated. That's what we're talking about here. And so in a hierarchy of origin firing, origins near genes that are being used are the first to replicate. Origins near genes that are not being used, like a muscle gene in a nerve cell is never going to be used in that nerve cell, it's going to fire after the genes that are nerve specific. And so euchromatin, in general, replicates first, and then heterochromatin is the last to replicate. So there's a very definite hierarchy based on genes and how they're used. So we have multiple origins for chromosomes, and they have different, different times during S phase when they're replicating. Anybody have any questions so far on this? Yes? Did you say euchromatin opens first? Euchromatin comes first, because that's where the vast majority of your genes are. Remember, you only have a few little gene islands uh, in the heterochromatin. Anybody else? All right. So all of this is taking place cell cycle that we've been talking about and using so far. Please remember, this isn't the real cell cycle. So I have exaggerated M here at the 
expense of G1. And a real cell cycle of G1 is huge and is tiny. But I'm doing it this way so we can see all the components. But what we are talking about are events happening in S phase, which is part of interphase. We've already been through this. So now let's take a look at what controls the cell cycle. Remember that what's happening is that we have a cell that's going to undergo mitosis and divide into two daughter cells. So we have alternating cycles of mitosis and growth. That's what this represents. Alternating cycles of mitosis and interphase is all about growth. The cell cycle is regulated. things start to double. Now, before a cell enters into S phase, 
that cell has to be perfect. And so we have what is called a checkpoint. So this symbol, this T, instead of an arrow, it's a blunt arrow, a T, pointing at this line between G1 and S. This is a checkpoint that controls whether or not a cell is permitted into S phase. You cannot allow cells to enter into S phase without being checked very carefully. And what they're being checked for, the two major things, first, growth. Again, if you look at a real pie chart, G1 is huge. S, G2, and M are small. So the majority of growth <coughs> is happening in G1. Cell has to ask itself, have I grown big enough in this phase here? Have I grown big enough to qualify for admission into S phase? And even more importantly than that, than that, the cell has to check for DNA damage. That's critical. The last thing in the world that you want to happen is to allow a cell with damaged DNA to replicate. That's a recipe for encouraging cancer. And so very elaborate checks on growth and DNA damage that we're going to cover in the later chapter on mutation and cancer. Because those are inevitably intertwined. But these are the checkpoints here that the cell has to get through. <coughs> Any questions on what I mean by a checkpoint and what they are and why they are? Yes. <coughs> Uh, no, and actually, thank you for the name. There's another checkpoint there, and then each one of these stages to ensure that the events in each stage are happening properly. But the next big checkpoint, so there's a checkpoint G1 to S. There is no checkpoint S to G2. And at S and G2, it's not a really hard line, it's, it's a really soft line. If whatever the cell finishes replicating, who cares? It, it's in G2. Then G2 is really small. But go from G2 to M, that's another really rigorous, really tight checkpoint that we are not going to cover. We're not going to cover it because it works exactly the same way. Some of the requirements are a little bit different. But it works exactly the same way as the one for G1 to S that we will cover later. Any questions on the diagram so far? Okay, we don't need this anymore. Is there a question? Uh, so let's look at control of G1 to S. There are two proteins that are critical for the checkpoint. The first one is called cyclin. The second is CDK. So cyclin, as the name implies, it's a protein made in a specific part of the cell cycle. It's a regulatory protein that has no activity. CDK stands for cyclin dependent kinase. So cyclin dependent means that this enzyme is dependent on cyclin to activate. A kinase is a generic name for an enzyme that adds phosphate to anything. In this particular case, or this particular kinase, 
This is a protein kinase. So this is going to phosphorylate other proteins. Now the general rule of thumb in cells, all eukaryote cells, not bacteria, all eukaryote cells, your metabolism is controlled largely, not exclusively, but mostly by whether an enzyme is phosphorylated or not. That means whether an enzyme has a phosphate added to it or not. Some enzymes have to have a phosphate added to activate them. Other enzymes have to have no phosphate, and you turn the enzyme off by phosphorylating it. So we have both classes of targets in the cytoplasm. Each kinase has a very specific, very rigorous set of targets. So you don't want kinases running around just phosphorylating any old thing. The target is very specific by the amino acid sequence. So you say so what? Depending on metabolism, what it depends on phosphorylation. On phosphorylation. On, on a kinase phosphorylating or dephosphorylating a protein. Phosphatases take off phosphate. Target. Target. Another protein. Anybody else? Yes. Binding of cyclin to CDK changes the structure of the CDK. <coughs> so I'm representing that now as converting the kinase from a circle that's inactive now to a square that's active. And now this kinase can start phosphorylating to proteins necessary to start replication. So we have to get all of the genes that code for the DNA polymerases and all the accessory proteins that we're going to talk about, probably not today, 
but certain, and Monday is a holiday, but on Wednesday, you'll start to look at the actual process. But understand that to replicate, make copies of the DNA, we need lots of protein. And so now, this kinase can start phosphorylating mechanism by which eukaryotes regulate the cell cycle. Some of the details differ slightly between yeast and humans, but the general pattern is exactly the same. Cyclins and CDK. And this activity is regulated by growth Step, I have the T bar, which is a negative step. So insufficient growth is going to hold up that progress. DNA damage is going to hold up that progress. <coughs> so is growth determined by the amount of active CDK? No, actually CDK is going to be a constant. Okay. Growth is going to be determined by titration of another protein. So you're, you're making you're doubling your proteins, and when a specific protein hits a level, that says it's okay. It's really complicated. We are not going to look at that in any detail at all. Any questions on how the cell cycle is regulated? Yeah. Um, you mean a, a mutation? Yeah. Too late. Sorry. So you, you, can, you cannot handle DNA repair in the end. DNA repair mm -hmm. can only be handled in G1, not even F, in G2. Mm -hmm. uh, so what it's looking here at yeah. is as mm -hmm. a chromosome condensed in us. Just exactly the step that I told you. It has it's a chromosome condensed. For M, when it's properly aligned in the metaphase plate, all it can look at. It can't go back and <coughs> check these two elements. Each check one checks for something different. And there's no way back. You may understand that you have a DNA tree. Anybody else? Yeah. So what does the active CDK and CY? So all, so all kinds of proteins have to be targeted. When you're going into M phase, among other things, you need the enzymes to take apart the nuclear membrane. You need to turn on the genes to make the DNA polymerases and all of the accessory proteins. You need all of that to happen. And so all of that is happening through this pathway. So there's a huge number of enzymes that are going to be turned on, activated by this pathway. Anybody else?
organ by organ, each stem cell has each stem cell type is a very limited range of what it can and can't do. There are other organisms, like lots of business, if you, if you take the tail off or go in the tail. Take your arm off, you're not going to go in the arm. People would like to know how that's done. Oh, no, 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 these skin cells are not going to go there. They are absolutely fixed in. And you can, you can take out fibroblasts, culture, and play with them, but you're not going to get your body. Your body will not command a fibroblast differentiated skin cell to replicate. Anybody else? Okay. In 1957, Arthur Kornberg discovered an enzyme that he called the DNA polymerase. He thought it was the replication enzyme. He won the Nobel Prize for it. It was later shown not to be the replication enzyme. It's a DNA repair enzyme. Nevertheless, he characterized the biochemistry of how this enzyme works. And since all DNA polymerases work exactly the same, the story that will develop from this uh, works for all DNA polymerases. Uh, this was done in E. coli, by the way. So DNA polymerase is an enzyme that can take DNA and replicate it. And so the reaction that this enzyme does is the following. So there's the three prime end. The ceiling is the five prime end. DNA polymerase only works five prime to three prime, which means adding on the three prime end of the chain. So there's the three prime end. We are going to add a nucleotide to the three prime end. That means five prime to three prime. This is an extraordinarily limited enzyme in what it can do. So the DNA polymerase uses the XEP, where X stands for any of the four bases, A, G, C, and P. There's going to be a template. We're not going to worry about that. We're just looking at the biochemistry of the reaction. So we have Phosphates. These are all phosphodiester bonds. What the enzyme does is line up the incoming nucleotide, and it's going to make bond there. <coughs> By removing water from the hydrogen from there and OH from there that I'm not going to show you. And a diphosphate is going to be released from that reaction. So with that hydrogen bond, we now have a new phosphor diester bond. Is ready to do the same thing there based on 
What does it do with the phosphate group? Uh, the phosphate is just phosphate in the cell. Okay. It'll get scavenged and used in other things. Uh, broken down, maybe used by a kinase and protein, maybe used to phosphorylate AMP to AVP to APP. Lots of uses for phosphate. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because I can. Tatabox? What's that? A Tatabox? T A T T A box? No. Where can we get a primer from? DNA polymerase can't make it. What's that? Someone said it. RNA. Absolutely. This primer is RNA primer. When we come back from fall break, two whole days, because we'll look at this in a little bit more detail. Have a good break, we'll be careful. 